gentlemen uh, for the sake of the the elderly ones amongst us I can't keep you standing for too long I apologize uh, I will call you to stand when the time is right please be seated like princes and princesses God bless you
very much. May I humbly call on the university librarian? That's the person of Mr. Josiah Adeyomoye. He will say the opening prayer. The librarian to the podium, sir. We remain standing for the opening prayer. Let us take this chorus. We are grateful. Oh Lord, we are grateful, Lord. We are grateful. Oh Lord, for all you have done for us. We are grateful, oh Lord. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed very grateful for being alive today. We thank you for the life of the guest lecture, I mean the Negro lecturer. We thank you for Caleb University. We thank you for the peace that obtains in this university. We thank you for our students. Thank you for everything you have been doing for us. We thank you for empowering the uh, Negro lecturer because we know you will speak through through her uh, this morning. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. As we continue this program, Father. Let the Holy Spirit dwell with us in Jesus' name. Take control of this, this program today in Jesus' name. So that at the end of the day, the glory will be yours in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I have prayed. Thank you, sir. As we remain standing, it is time for the national anthem. The national anthem.
gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank God for a day like this. This is the sixth inaugural lecture of Caleb University, Lagos. In fact, um, the man who started it rolling, the very first inaugural lecturer himself, is none other than Professor Nusa Owens. EBA, put your hands together for him. And so, on behalf of the visitor, the chairman, board of trustees and the members, the chairman and members of council, the vice chancellor, as I said earlier on, the deputy vice chancellor, academic, the deputy vice chancellor, uh, Risa, the librarian, the registrar, and the entire management, the deans, the directors, senate, heads of department, heads of units, all of us together, and of course, our cherished students, I welcome you once again to the sixth inaugural lecture uh, of, Lego, of, of Caleb University. Thank you very much. I, I see an array of dignitaries here, and I cannot continue without mentioning them one by one. And so I, I welcome the Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Nasser Wen CBA. Put your hands together for him. And I humbly welcome Professor Sunday Ajewale, the DVC ACAD. I don't think he's here present right now. But of course, I see my yoga, Professor Olale Asikia, DVC Risa. Put your hands together for him, please. I welcome you, sir, the registrar, Mr. Mayoku Olumeru. Put your hands together for him. I also humbly and respectfully welcome our bursar, Mr. Adeshina Abubakri. He's, he's on his way. Put your hands together for him. As I move on to appreciate and welcome our dear librarian, Mr. Josiah Ade Yomuye. Put your hands together for him. I see the Dean of Corpus, Professor Dari Abel, put your hands together for him. The Dean of Kolensma, Professor Luwale Alagwe, please appreciate him. I see my own Dean, Professor Olate Shomori, Dean Kasmas, please appreciate her especially. And I cannot forget Professor Barine Widobe, he's Dean of CBS. You're welcome, sir. And of course, my pastor, Dr. Olorun Lano, the Dean of Student Affairs. You're welcome, sir. We shall continue as the program progresses to identify and recognize dignitaries. I also, on behalf of the inaugural lecturer, welcome all the special invitees here present today. Please put your hands together for them. Thank you very much. Having said that, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nusa Owens Ibia, for his opening address. Please put your hands together. Keep clapping until he gets here. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So Lord, he died all that he gave us his son. Oh, he that is life and atonement for sin. And opened our life in our Today is a very special day. 
and we give God all the glory for making today possible. On April 9, 2013, I gave the first our the inaugural, inaugural lecture. And uh, I thank God because between then and now, Caleb University has witnessed such a transformation that I'm sure our, our big boss, Professor Ralph Hakim Feleye, uh, who, who uh, for many years in the University of Lagos and, and, and even came to the hall before we arrived, you know, we attest to the fact that when he came the last time, what he saw is not what he's seeing today. So I want to thank God that the first inaugural lecture for, for this year, because right now, and in order to ensure that inaugural lecture is a tradition in universities, that we can have a sustained series. We have nine inaugural lectures between this one and October 2025. So, and because we are very gender sensitive, we are having uh, uh, Professor Lu Yin Kai Son, who is the representative of uh, the women, you know, uh, having to give the very first inaugural lecture in 2024. I thank God for our life. I thank God for how God has led her till this point. I thank God that she has with her her family here. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of progress and all glory to God Almighty. What is it saying about Caleb University? It's saying that Caleb University is marching from strength to strength and the gates of hell will never prevail. So I congratulate her because I know that today, I don't know what she has put in the inaugural lecture, but she has already warned that I should look out for something. You know, so I don't know. But I also thank God that some of our former students, you know, they are here. Because years ago, uh, they were the, uh, they were the, they were the, uh, is this 16? They called it, they are never older than 16. But now some of them are already mammatic. You know, so we thank God for that. So I want you to just be um, relaxed because what you are going to witness here is a feast. You know, a feast, an intellectual feast. And I know that she is going to titillate your appetite with offer, an offer that will be better than whatever the combination of Oriental Hotel, Sheraton, uh, Four Seasons, at Sher I mean, at Sheraton, name all of them, all the big hotels in town that they will ever offer. And I want to also, because this is the seal of the professorship of anyone. When you give your inaugural lecture, I know that the other day uh, they were talking about a inaugural lecture. That is for those maybe who ran through the system. They did not give an inaugural, inaugural lecture, so they now come back to come and give it, maybe after retirement. And I know that, uh, you know, uh, Professor Akifele, so fourth estate of the wreck, <laughs> thank God the Fort Estate is not wrecking it is building so thank you very much for coming and I pray your, joy of jo your day of joy if it hasn't come it will come in Jesus name so thank you very much and I'm praying that for all of those of you who have come a long way I can see people from Lasso and elsewhere I, I know you made a sacrifice and people will also make sacrifice to celebrate you in Jesus name God bless you as we wait for the lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Please, you can do much better than that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, once again, I welcome all our special invitees. Once I get the list, I shall mention your names one by one. It's a great pleasure to have you join us on a day like this. God bless you richly. Moving on now, I humbly invite the inaugural lecturer to please stand come to the podium and yes ma just walk majestically to the podium and um, stand by yeah. thank you so much
much more than that and I'm sure that when the time comes you will do the right thing absolutely absolutely we have an equally excited orchestra your flourish is going beyond the barrier but that's all in it for a good day it's, it's allowed I will proceed to read a little profile in lieu of a full citation in honor of the inaugural lecturer for today. Professor Essa, a Commonwealth scholar, holds a doctorate degree in sociology from the University of Glasgow, 1993. Prior to this, she had studied at the University of Lagos in Lagos, Nigeria, where she bagged a BSc honors degree in mass communication that was in 1981 feel free to clap if you want to clap please thank you thereafter she obtained the ma degree in radio and tv from oyo university athens oyo usa in 1983 she is now as you can see a professor in broadcasting film and development communication at Caleb University, Limota, Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs> Oluyinka Eshto maintains an interest in the social relevance of Nigerian media and film messages. She brings non-Western perspectives to the study of media, film, and communication. Her study of production practices, foregrounds inquiries into cultures of reception, offering insights to audience pleasures, meanings that are created and circulated, with a particular focus on women and children, is quite remarkable. Committed to bridging gaps between theory and practice, her quest is to develop knowledge and understanding of media and film cultures for social and behavior change communication. Professor Essan has spent close to four decades in academia <laughs> teaching and conducting research and applying these in consultancy projects. Her teaching career began in 1984 as an assistant lecturer at her alma mater, that's the Department of Mass Communication, University of Lagos. Please clap if you are disposed to doing that. Yes. Thank you. She rose to the position of senior lecturer before moving over to the University of Winchester uh, School of Media and Film in 2001. There she attained the post of reader before joining Caleb University in 2020. Her teaching cuts across theory and practical dimensions of broadcasting, that's radio, TV, film, advertising, and journalism, with an underlying focus on social change. Her research and publications also reflect this versatility. She has remained consistent in her attention to audiences and emerging cultures in media and the society. She has contributed to the design of practical and theoretical modules for various academic programs, including the MPhil slash PhD program in media and communication at Caleb University. Yes, please. She has also helped to develop and deliver courses for in-service media professionals. ESSA has consulted for UN agencies and others within the third sector for Nigerian-based non-governmental organization. Professor Esson speaks regularly at learned conferences and webinars, especially at the annual conference organized by the Association of Communication Scholars and Professionals of Nigeria, AXPEN, to which she is 
Deputy President. I expect you to applaud at these vital places. Thank you. She has served as the series book editor of the association. She is also the founding editor of the Communication Cultures in Africa, an open access journal published by the Winchester University Press, which she developed all by herself. She had convened the Rethinking Media and Journalism Practice Conference at the University of Winchester and the Media Mother Matters Roundtable Conference. I expect another round of applause there. There are several book chapters and journal articles to her credit. Some are still in progress as we speak. But she remains most proud of one which is the most comprehensive account of television practices in Nigeria, and that's the monograph Nigerian Television, 50 Years of Television in Africa. It was published by Princeton. Please put your hands together for her. The Vice Chancellor, sir, I do proudly and happily, uh, happily invite the inauguration, the inaugural speaker for today to please advance. I guess I'm excited as well, and I have every right to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit uncomfortable because I'm wearing heels. Full confession. I'm wearing heels. Which I ordinarily, I mean, these days I don't wear heels. But I have to wear heels today. I said to someone earlier on, in Form 2, we did a traditional dance. But I'm doing Coco Ka. I can't wear flat shoes. That the flat shoes will not do coco car, so that's why I'm wearing heels. So I'm, if I take my shoes off, you know that it has the the squeezing has got to that point. So please bear with me. That said, I want to welcome everyone here this afternoon. Or is it still morning? I really, really am grateful for your presence here. Okay. Let me go through the protocols once I get my document up. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, and uh, Vice Chancellor, the esteemed chairman of today, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic in absentia, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation, Strategy and Administration, RISA, the Registrar, and all other principal officers, Dean of Postgraduate School, Dean of my college, CASMAS, and all other deans, academic directors and heads of department, professors, members of Senate, teaching and non-teaching staff of Caleb University, distinguished colleagues and friends from other institutions, from other universities, friends of the university and special guests. In this category, I must give special obeisance to my teacher and the head of department who hired me when I started 40 years ago, Professor Ralph Akifeleye. My dear students of Caleb University and from previous incarnations, gentlemen and ladies of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all. Indeed, this is the day that the Lord has made. I rejoice and I'm glad in it. I give thanks to God for this day, 
in which his name is glorified on my account. I have handled many assignments in my life, but I promise you, this has been one of the most challenging. Not because I haven't given lectures, I've given lectures all my life. Not because I don't know, I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't have the gift of the gab, but an inaugural lecture is different. The sheer anticipation of being the center of attraction is somewhat unsettling. Still, there's work to be done, and so it must. Here we are at Caleb, in, Caleb University, Imota. I'm honored to present the sixth inaugural lecture in this university, coming on the heels of Professor Olamade, who handed the button to me uh, in my brief stint as dean of my college. This is the fifth inaugural lecture from the College of Arts, Social and Management Sciences, CASMAS. In my department, none other than the Vice Chancellor and Chairman of this occasion handed me the baton. Mine is the second inaugural lecture from the Department of Mass Communication. My passion for this multi-dimensional field began at an early age and I've put on my slide the early inspirers. I chose mass communication above law or education, the courses which my father thought was best suited to me. Um, my, his pet name for me was Grammatical Yinka because I was the one who was always talking and asking questions and things. So he thought, yeah, you, this one is going to be a teacher or she will be a lawyer. But then I, didn't, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a lawyer. I certainly was not going to be a teacher. That's what I thought, but here we are. Olu Inka was inquisitive, outspoken, expressive. God bless my mom, Florence Musumola, who taught me to read, to learn new words, and to use them appropriately. She and my grandfather, Pa Samuel Odumosu, whose photograph is seen there, um, he, they, told, they were the storytellers, and the story time came with riddles, Alo Akpamo and Alo Akpagbe. Perhaps I took this more seriously than most. I learned to ask questions and engage critically. OGMG, wave your hands. For all the years that I tormented you with my many questions. <laughs> my classmates at MGHS often found this very infuriating. I would inquire if I did not understand my, if I did not understand the subject. My mission in school was to learn after all. And even when I understood the topic, I still needed clarification. So I would ask, does that mean that? And that was very infuriating. So they labeled me, does that mean that? Obviously, you know how these things go. Along with the pleasures of stories came my appreciation of language, culture, and communication. I found this, I found this in music and on radio and television, films and newspapers. My encounter with this cannot be taken for granted as we do. Reading newspapers was my father's daily ritual. And he won't buy one paper, he won't buy two. He will buy a whole lot, Time Sketch, Tribune, Later, it was Guardian, Concord, and Punch. I mean, I don't know why Daddy bought those papers, but obviously he cottoned on to the fact that there are different perspectives in different papers, and he would buy them on a daily basis. My now not so little brother, he would take money out of his pocket money. He was very flush back then. He would go and buy Evening Times just to read Little Joe, the cartoon. He will buy the Evening Times. He doesn't want to read the story, just the cartoon. And then the rest of us will read the rest. So Little Joe Bembella and the newspaper was left for whoever wanted to read it. At home, radio programs were always available on tap from the rediffusion box in my father's chemist. And we spent a reasonable time in the chemist because we lived above it. So that was something that introduced me to radio service, the radio broadcasting service of uh, Radio Nigeria. Um, so you found Edo, Efik, Fufulde, Hausa, Igbo, Ijo, Kanuri, Tiv, Yoruba. The news would come in all those Nigerian languages. So from that early age, I had become quite aware 
of the diversity of Nigeria. The mission of the station was most poignant during the Nigerian Civil War. There was no ambiguity in the mission. To keep Nigeria one. You see, our media did so. Some people don't know. You see this side of the hall, there was no answer. I think those are, that's the Gen Z. To keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done. Sadly, we, we did make that task, we succeeded in that task at great cost, but there are people today who are querying the merit of that union. I also grew up in Ikrod Road, the part where, oh, I've gone beyond myself there. Okay, so that's Radio Nigeria. Yeah, that's Ikrod Road. I grew up on Ikrod Road. <laughs> The part where the boundaries, we used to be in Western region before the boundaries were redrawn. So you can imagine Ikorodu Road, Fadei was Western region. Those of you who know where Fadei is, that's where I grew up. It was unlike the idyllic setting where my husband, Olufemi Esson, grew up. And our pastimes were different. They had adventures on the UI campus. And we, we counted cars. Blue. How many blue cars are going along? How many red cars? How many white cars? Because we lived on Ikorodro, that's what we saw. We also would count the number of people going around and then imagine where they could be going to. I don't know if my other siblings did this, but in my head I would imagine where are they going to. On Sunday evening they are going to their to the uh, tribal, the, uh, you know, the village meeting. So those were for me the makings of my life as a researcher. Unlike most TV users who only got one station, those who lived in the Bado area got WNTV, those who lived in Lagos, they got NBC TV. We got both. So we had more, to, to, to more of a fare from television from back then. And it was, it was fun to watch TV, especially when the house was full, when the contingent from Ibado was around. Oh, we thank God. These are memories, these are memories that, that we hold on dear to. My most, uh, most of my encounter with film was via television when I was little. Movies, the, the, the made-for-TV movies were the comfort in the home and with the for the family. They were usually imported films, reruns of, of box office hits, helping to expand our repertoire of knowledge enriching our cultural capital, especially in the global context, such that then when you went, when one went abroad, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult to fit in as it were. So thank God for, for uh, film, whether it came from TV or wherever else it came from. Let me tell you where else it came from, um, from church, and I will get to talk about that. But I think one of the memories that is etched in my, one of the experiences that's etched in my memory is an, an uncle who came back from England and he had his film reel and he showed, so we watched the sound of music in his house. That was quite different from the, um, the experience of watching the missionary films during a church outreach. Okay, so I'm going to move quickly on. Um, I'm skipping some of this. My engagement with music was beyond radio and television and film. In our cultural context, one encounters music everywhere, at family gatherings, various festivals, on the streets with their rich kaleidoscope of sounds, local traders advertising their wear, medicine men, corn men, anyone seeking to draw a crowd will make music, beggars soliciting for assistance. So some here may remember, I don't know, Kokoro, the blind, the blind minstrel. Yeah, a reminder of the character that we read of in Akin the Drama Boy. Apparently, the story of Akin the Drama Boy is woven around him somewhat. So, yeah, these are some of the early ex uh, uh, encounters that I had with the media. And I'm, I'm going to be the typical teacher. Now that I know you have the lecture in your hands, I'm going to scroll on very quickly and ask you to think about, um, to catch up on some of the rest of the story by reading the text that we've given to you. <laughs> okay, so yes, we encountered music, sometimes in the stores like Kingsway, or sometimes in music shops that were blaring. So my choice of course at university at the undergraduate level must be regarded as a rite of passage. 
It must be regarded as a rite of passage because it wasn't usual for a child to win an argument against the parent. So my father wanted me desperately to study English, sorry, um, education or law. And I said, no, I wanted to study mass comm. So how, how are we going to break this? It was uh, Mr. I.S. Muemeke, the MD of Linters at the time, who encouraged my dad to let me have my way. And having seen that, yeah, a, having understood that mass comm could lead to a respectable path, he did let, it let me go. My brief stint at um, Linters during my uh, vacation, first year in, uh, in, u in university, helped me seal the deal. I talk about my, in the lecture, I've mentioned my, um, my encounter, my re undergraduate research work. And I mentioned this because it's formed the basis of my interest, as it were, in communicating, marketing communications. And so I'm saying from that interest in marketing communication, coupled with the interest in development communication, I cut my teeth for the need to communicate for social change. I realized very quickly that the same way we sell Bonvita, we can sell good ideals, we can sell good behavior, we can sell good values. And the credit for this goes to my late teacher and project supervisor. He only died late last year, Professor Andrew Azukaigo Muemeka. I thank God for his life and his impact on mine. From him, I learned the importance of three key conditions required for effective communication. Messages must be relevant, accessible, and must foster participation. This means that we must, this means that we must know the audiences, know their context, and live experiences. For programs to be accessible, they must be in the right format, use the right language, and pitched at the right level so that we can then ensure that there is comprehension. This includes accurate knowledge of the reference that targets can relate with. In other words, a message design requires knowledge of cultural codes. Messages must be strategically disseminated. We must find where the audience are located within the social strata, however this may be defined. I still teach using the knowledge continuum that was introduced to me in my undergraduate days. And the aphorism, a man convinced against his will, is of the same opinion still. Thanks to this lecture, I, know, I now know where that came from. Because I then researched to see where exactly did this come from. And it has come from the uh, poem, Hoodie Brass, which you have on the slide. Okay, for the purpose of time, I am moving on very, very quickly. Um, and I'll just use my slides to say, yes, Communication must be purposeful, and me media messages must foster participation. Yeah. Okay, so this is where my journey began. I started from Unilag, as you've heard. I went to Ohio University, the older of the two, of the two big known universities in Ohio. Um, not Ohio State, but Ohio University in, in Athens, Ohio. In this, I had followed in the footsteps of my mommy and daddy, big mommy and daddy in Ilori, pro late professor and Mrs. Uh, God rest their soul and thank God for their impact on my life. I moved from um, Ohio University to Glasgow University and we are here today. Um, in terms of my academic journey, I started from Unilag. As I said, I, um, it was about this time I, and I resumed work in April. So just, you can imagine the, the processing was be ongoing about this time 40 years ago. From there, I moved on to, I spent 17 years in Unilag, and then I had to leave. Thank God. Thank God. I'm, I'm saying thank God because I'm remembering the circumstances under which I had to leave. Um, I spent 17 years in Winchester, and here I am in Caleb. I've been here since 2020. I hope nobody's counting. <laughs> I hope you're not counting to see whether I'm going to be here for 17 years. <laughs> okay, so let me go on to the 
main stuff then, uh, personal memories of how the media shaped me. Um, let me talk about some of the um, programs that I watched as a child. I've only put some here. Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Do you remember that? Skippy, Skippy was from Australia. It was based in Australia. And then we also have, um, I can hardly see now. Well, oh, yeah. Cartwright family. Do you guys know who the Cartwright family is? You don't know? Okay, so who, who is going to, who's going to volunteer to do the song? Oh, no, that's Skippy. Skippy the bush kangaroo. Very good. Let's do Cartwright family. <laughs> What's the next? Cartwright family, where is that? Tong Green, thank you. You see, those people... I know the people who came from my, from my house. <laughs> so, uh, Cartwright family, Bonanza. You guys might remember, remember it as Bonanza, okay? There, of course, the man from Uncle. I don't know. Those were, like, I mean, the man from Uncle. You also have um, Flintstones. Ooh, Flintstones. With the Flintstones. We never really knew what they said. I don't know if you did, but I never really knew what they said. Well, what I find fascinating in hindsight is the fact that um, the, the cat, the man put the cat out with its milk. Then the, in the closing sequence of the, of the series, the man put the cat out with the milk. Then the, milk, the, the cat went in through the window and put the man of the house out of the house and locked the door. Of course, the man of the house didn't see, think he could jump in through the window. He stood at the door and was shouting, Wilma, calling to his wife, Wilma, open the door. What do these things mean? They're not mindless. Man from uncle isn't mindless. Even Skippy and Maya. Maya is the last one that I put up there. Maya is set in India with the, with the um, Indian boy helping an American boy to find his father who was lost in the jungle. Maya is the elephant, not the person. And the elephant was, was the one that we also liked. It was, it was um, fascinating to see a child and an elephant. Okay, so that's, just are just examples. Of course, if you, by the time you read the lecture, you will see that there are more examples of programs that I watched as a child and how they defined who I was. I think the point I'm trying to make here is the fact that um, many things we watch, we don't maybe pay attention to, but then they may make an impact on who we are. As someone, as the young lady who I said to about my shoes, she said, the impact of a song. Because I sang Batamiadu Kokoka, I have insisted on wearing high heel shoes even when they are not comfortable for me. So you can see how some of these subtle things do, do come along. Okay. Um, right. I'm moving on. I've, I've jumped a lot during in that section and moving on to my time in the UK and how um, I will find that, um, and how I would find that the media in, in, at that time, in, or in that context, were a help to me. The media were indeed a comfort blanket. Television in particular was a comfort blanket. It was an inexpensive and undemanding pastime. It offers company and unobtrusive companions. So you can watch soap operas, you can watch EastEnders and make friends with them, but they don't come to your house and they don't knock on your door and they don't disturb you. Uh, they, but then they're also a cultural guide showing occurrences and patterns of behavior in society. News and other genres and game shows are examples of shows that we watch. And when they show those things that may affect us in everyday life, they also give us helplines for people with issues, with the issues being portrayed. So you can call, contact a helpline to get some help. Um, the, the broadcasting, TV in the UK is still faithful to the public broadcasting, public service broadcasting ideals. Although home is best, 
Uh, so many, many a time we would still look to be in touch with home. And I would call that concept globalization. We are glo global citizens, but we're still local at heart. And we're able, even those of us who are at home, we may be locally situated, but we are global beings indeed. So we will keep in touch with Nollywood videos. That was in the noughties. Currently, we can tune in to TVC and watch TVC as you're watching it. We can get onto your view and make our comments and things like that. Okay, so let me move on to media communication and who we are and what in terms of media and identity. Okay, and here I, here I start to argue that the media play crucial roles in shaping and reflecting who we are as individuals. Okay, they shape who we are as individuals. you will find that the media influence our beliefs, our behaviors, and our perceptions. What's also more important is that they shape our worldviews. That is, the way we see the world, the way we relate with others. The media are very crucial, in a sense, in helping us determine how we're going to relate with others. So, the question... Are uh, media all powerful? Will they make us do as they want? Do we lack discretion or other influences that mitigate the enormous power of the media? No doubt, the media contribute to the construction of identity and the way we interact with the world. This is the nugget at the heart of my academic career, wanting to see how this of all operates and to tap into it. Now, there's a corollary to that. I say the media datos, which is what I've demonstrated, looking for the Gen Zs and saying, oh, they don't know what, uh, they don't know about Cartwright family. They've never heard Bonanza. What is Kippy? And some of us, know. so the, the media datos, we will know. There's some things that they would know that we don't know. So the media we consume will determine as it were, can reflect where we are. So the, me the media frame our world's view, as we said. Our consumption of media defines us. What peace we have. By the time you watch CNN, if you live on a diet of CNN and CNN alone, you might just, want to, you might just think that, what's the point? Let's just end it and go. The world is coming to an end. So the, what peace we have. Our notions of friend and foe. I, I've, I've argued severally that the media contribute largely to the culture of suspicion and distrust. It's your mother-in-law, she wants to kill you. Your father's wife, she's looking for your downfall. In fact, these days, if you are following the story of Mubad, the, 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 that is our local... Um, music star who, who has passed on. If you are following that story, you might start to think, the people who I'm working with, they are ready to buy me, as they say, to use their language. So it's important for us to know the notions of friend and foe as determined by the media, that this sometimes is not as it is. Our esteem of fortunes and woes might also be determined by the media. Our sense of worth and well-being who are we may be largely determined by the media. But then that's assuming, I don't know if you see that, um, sorry, I, I don't, if, if, we, if you can see that cartoon that I put, put there, that's assuming that audiences are passive, that the audiences don't know what they're doing. They will just take whatever they are spoon-fed by the media. Okay, moving on. Media play a role in, sorry, we, we, I will argue that the media play, that we play a role in the way that the media shape us. How well do we read the messages? Do we recognize um, the ideas, norms, and values that we receive? 
How do we rate sources and media? How do we rate the sources from which the media have come, or even the sources that are within the media messages? All these things might determine how the messages are received. The media we access may determine the size or quality of our social circles. The contemporary, that is in contemporary times, the media may determine the, um, the quality and size of our social circle. Yet, because the media are all around us, we may feel that they're not to be bothered with. We cherry pick those elements of the media that deserve comment. And usually it's for criticism, seldom praise. This makes the media m m so insidious. And it's for this reason that we should, I say we should, we sh that's the reason why we study the media. And one thing I know is that audiences are active. In case you can't, yeah? But it's these days we are not waiting for programs to be pushed to us. We are pulling down our media fare, what we want to consume. So in terms of identity, how do we acquire identity? Our identity is socially constructed, it's dynamic, it's not fixed as we assume. And we assume this through socialization. Our cultural identity is nurtured by family, um, ethnic cleavages, education, religious affiliation, social strata, and our consumption of the media. So you can see, um, you can see gender, generation, creed, race. What's happening? Time is up. Okay. Okay. More or done? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, gender, generation, creed. Sorry. In the, in the name of openness, there's nothing secret that they told me. They only said that they can't see my face. It's a pity I'm too short. I'm, I'm hiding behind the podium and behind my laptop. So I need to make an effort to move around. Um, I would move around if I could see and just use my slide. Um, but thank you. I, 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 but I couldn't do that. Okay. So please pardon me. Those of you, hey, Fola, I'm saying hello to my daughter who is joining virtually. The only one of my children who is in here. Fola, you can see me. So I'm making an effort for everyone who is joining virtually so that you can see my face. Do, I do apologize. Okay, so I said gender, generation, your, your, your gender, your generation, your creed, your race, your ration, nationality. Um, oh, by the way, congratulations. We're all proud to be Nigerians, aren't we? We're on to the finals. Yeah? I knew that would get you. I knew that would get you. That, that's one time that we are glad to be Nigerians. So you see what I mean by um, identity is fluid, not fixed. So at one point, we are happy to be Nigerians. At another point, maybe, oh, this Nigeria. May Nigeria not happen to you. We want to jackpot. You know, so these are, and sometimes it depends on where you are. If you have just heard a good sermon from church, your religion is mixing with your your, um, what's it called, your family pride and your, uh, your racial pride, your nationality pride and you're saying, this Nigeria is our country, we must do better for them. So you get the point. So I'm moving on from this slide, guys. Okay, and because of that, hey, I hope nobody is hungry. We perform identity, yeah? We, not only do we construct our identity, we perform our identity. Once upon a time, only poor people will eat rice in leaves. But these days, the rich want to eat the rice in leaves. Yeah? They want to, uh, we, are, uh, we are home bread. We can eat the ayamase. I will, please serve it in leaves and bring it to the party, even though you are bringing it to the tray. Same thing, the humble yo-yo will come to the party with gari 
And okay, so they've jazzed it up. They put ice block and sugar, and some people will add milk. But you get the point I'm making. Performing identity, we even go to the book and we take our Oimbo friends. We are, we are proud of that. One of the things that's gone on in recent times is the, the, the different challenges that we've, we've had. You've had them, um, we've had them, um, okay. I'm, I'm timing myself, that's why. Um, so you, you, we've had the, what do you call it? We've had the Fufu Challenge. Yeah, do you guys, how many of you are familiar with the Fufu Challenge? Yeah, we've done the Fufu Challenge. We've done all kinds of challenges just to show that um, we are happy. We've done Niger versus Ghana, Jollof. Okay, so th that's a part of performing identity. But then it's, sometimes it will seem like um, what, what we wear too, with what we wear, we perform our identity. So let me show you this. We perform identity with what we wear. And this used to be a policy on, on Nigerian television where the um, Nigerian Television Authority in the, in the 80s, where people were encouraged to wear their national attire. And what seemed like a very innocuous um, action could also, was also somewhat of a threat to the nation. So when Hawa Baba Ahmed came on with her hijab, it wasn't seen in certain quarters as somebody being a good role model for young Muslim women, which is what some people somewhere had felt was the case and had advocated for, and the NTA had also then um, pursued that policy. But then some others saw it as evidence of the Islamic hegemonic struggle that the, he the Islamic hegemony was trying to take over. It wouldn't be long before they would make us all be wearing hijabs and things. So what seemed to, what was intended to bring us together then had became potential for separating us. In communication, it is important to recognize shared system of symbolic, verbal, and non-verbal behaviors. Those that are meaningful to group members those with whom there is a shared sense of belonging, shared tradition, space, assets and resources, and similar norms of appropriate behavior. That leaves the challenge of communicating across cultures. Because if it's easy for us to communicate with ourselves, how do we communicate across cultures? Especially when they, there are resources to be shared. So I, I, the, the thing about the Islamic hegemony becomes meaningful because we think it's going to affect our share of the national cake. That's my take. Okay, so how do we perform identity? I'm, I'm looking back again now at the way in which identity um, is constructed. We can construct identity uh, by the for ourselves, and we can also construct identity for the collective. What is it that we do? Uh, um, and I think, as I've explained, it's about the foundations of our inheritance. That's what gives it life. One more thing that we need to uh, think about is the way in which um, our communication may also inform the stereotypes that we hold about people. So I put a cartoon there, just because I'm, I was Asian. The kids thought I know martial arts. Good thing I did. <laughs> so what if you didn't know martial arts? Does every Asian know martial arts? I, I, I think we, we need to question ourselves and the way in which we, um, the way in which we engage with, um, the way in which we, engage with other people because of where they come from or how we think they should be. Right, we're moving on. Um, right, um, so media communication, media and communication. I have argued that media, that communication is as old as life itself. So taking the biblical account of creation, we know 
that in the beginning was the word. This verse of scripture is an inspiration for the strategic place of communication at all levels of life. Now, I take the Tower of Babel as well and imagine what happens if we don't understand, if we understand each other, if we don't, as it is that we don't understand each other. So, think about the cavemen. These were the earliest, um, the ca cavemen were at the earliest, Stone Age was the earliest civilization, and the cavemen left paintings. They're still communicating with us, as they must have done with other people who they encountered in the course of their lives. Along with images, um, we have... Sorry. I had a bottle of water. Is this mine? Oh, thank you. Bless you, darling. It's not stylish, you I'm just feeling a bit stifled. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Right, so the point is made about the cavemen being able to communicate. But along with their images, they used images. That was what we had from them. But we also used gestures, we used smoke signals and drums. We'll come back to that when we talk about African cultures. These form, these uh, signs, uh, are, they form the bedrock of our understanding of media and how they work in society. So let's go on to talk about media as technology. And McLuhan had recognized the media as extensions of ourselves. He noted that the um, Western civilization had mastered mechanical technologies to extend human capacity, demonstrating their ability to compress both time and space. Men, even succeeded in launching to space and walking on the moon. Mechanical technologies combined with electric energy have helped us to overcome speed and space of many human operations, and examples are bound for this. Whether in face-to-face -face communication or in um, mass communication, we still find a way of communicating. We've now evolved into a, into the post-industrial era where information has truly exploded. Thank you. I do beg your pardon. I, I, I'm starting to feel faint and that's why I need to sit down. Okay, so um, media as technology, and we talked about, sorry for all this drama, I guess it's just a bit of spice to the event. I do beg your pardon. Okay, so technology that facilitated industrialization and the rise of urbanized settlement also has helped in, in, a way, in ways to alter, the, um, to alter the ways of living. So you have the motor cars, steam, the steam engines, um, and the printing press. 
Yes, thank you. That's better. Thank you. Oshie. Thank you. No, don't worry. Just leave it there. It's fine there. It's fine there. It's fine there. It's, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so technology that facilitated industrialization helped to develop urbanization and altered the ways of living. So you can see how first it was the motor cars that made the travel shorter between different places and also meant that you could send things along. You could, you could send parcels. So when we got the printing press, we were able to get, get um, what do you call them, get packages of our newspapers. And we could produce not just letters, we could pro produce newspapers and send them in bulk via uh, transport. And then, of course, we also had, as it were, a film that was traveling around at the time. So um, these are examples of how technology had helped to, but I don't want to It's not for, uh, it's nice to have, to be an alone one. Okay, but, okay, it's working now, that's fine. Okay, so the, the last technology that I held on, that I've presented to you here is the radio. And the radio, uh, how that helps to bring information to people um, around the world and to compress to compress time and space. That's the issue. So let's move on to media communication and who we are. Print and outdoor media in brief. And it really is going to have to be brief because I want to move on very quickly. Um, okay, so print media was, what was actually one of the first media that we had, but at this point in time, uh, print media seems to be in trouble. Um, so maybe Prof is right about the uh, fourth estate of the wreck. Maybe not, I don't know what the wreck is, but something is happening to our print run and they're disappearing. Not just in Nigeria, but around the world. And I brought an example here from the United States. The strategic importance of newsstands has only shrunk. Newsstand sales fell from a high of 35% in the late 70s to less than 10% uh, in the early 2000s and to a mere 3% of the total circulation. Okay. Okay, so, um, so in, indeed the, there's been a major drop in, in the sales and profit that's coming from the print media. But um, just to give you a taste of the uh, newspapers, what they looked like at the time, and I'm asking you to think about um, the way in which once we had newspapers that didn't have pictures. I wonder whether even I could read newspapers without pictures. You can see I'm a very visual person. Um, we, um, we also have had advertising along with that. Um, the News vendors, I don't know if you people are Gen Z, of course, if you are familiar with um, Free Readers Association. I'm not sure that it's something, it's a culture that you can be familiar with. But then there was once upon a time that people felt so that they needed to read newspapers, not just my dad who could buy the papers. Those who couldn't buy the paper would go and make friends with the vendor and they would stand around and read. And then they would have discussions around. So you, so you know that that's what. Of course, we had the town criers as well, that um, town criers were a local way of getting information. Um, and it wasn't only in Nigeria. I'd, I'd like to show you the fact that the traditions that we see, the things around us that seem like um, we're backward, are, are things that happen in other societies as well. So we need to be really aware. Okay, examples of, of um, advertising. Sorry. I'm not showing you, I, I, I beg your pardon. So that's what I want. The examples of the newspapers and examples of the Free Readers Association, newspapers that are living, the, um, the uh, what do you call them? The town crier, 
examples of early advertising, nothing to compare with the slick kind of advertising that we have these days. Okay, so yeah, that's the newspaper again. So let's go to the medium of film. And I just introduced you to, in, you'll read about it in the lecture, the three main ways by which film came into Nigeria. Commercial, commercial, um, the commercial, the way is that which we're familiar with. But then there was the religious and also the government. And this is an example of government when we will have, and this is what one of the things that we did in Ministry of Information. We had this, the van, the, uh, the, fil the film unit in a van, and it will go into the hinterland and show films to the people. So you can read all about that in the, in the book. But let me call your attention to something that was said about film, how it's tied as it were, you can read the quotation, no you can't, but it's in the, it's in the lecture slide. But the points we're making is how cinematograph, transport uh, bridge and all of that was tied into the spectacle of governance and how government used film back then. They're not even starting to use film now. So now they are having to cooperate with Nollywood to get them to come on the day that they're doing elections. But back in the day, the film unit was actually in the it was right in the, in the uh, what do you call it? it, right in the Ministry of Information. Control that. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, so that's the, a more like the cinema that you know compared with what I showed you in the previous slide. Okay, so let's go to broadcasting. And broadcasting, what I'm saying here is how you saw, I talked about rediffusion and you saw the rediffusion box that we, the kind of example of radio that we had back then. But then there's more. These days, radio has come a long way. Radio has come from being that medium that doesn't speak, that, that, no, sorry, that doesn't respond to you when you speak. You now have people in the studio. And radio is not the, uh, the medium that you don't see anymore. You can see, um, what's his name, Berekete. How many of you know Berekete, ordinary president? You, you can see him on YouTube. It's not only that we would listen we can record it, it's, it's archived there on social media. So the convergence of social media with traditional media has changed the media scape. And I've given you the example of Perekete and, um, and um, Agidigbo FM, which is in Ibadan, one of the things, uh, one of the places that I've studied recently. I've also introduced the concept of this modes. This is something that I, that I discovered in, um, in my research, that there are different modes of viewing those who, those who, thank you, those who will, um, those who will, there are different modes of viewing. Those people who will come to viewing deliberately, that is, I want to watch something and go to watch it. There are some who are just incidentally, like the gentleman who is sitting there reading the newspaper, but the TV is on. He's ostensibly not watching. But if there's something that catches his attention, he will lift up his eyes and watch. And so we tell you that he's not watching, he doesn't watch television, but then when they discuss things on television, we do around the world, he will know what he's talking about. Then, of course, I, I'm not sure that that image is clear to you, but it will be clear in your mind, I hope. Um, the children who were sent on an errand, this is in Ishagamu. This is in Ekwe area of Shagamu. They were sent on an errand, and Mama's television was on, and there's a program that they liked, and so they stopped to watch. Okay, so you may not be in Ekwe, you may not be in this part, but then many people watched 9-11 uh, on the run. They were on the move when they saw 9-11. And um, the, the other space that I talked, the other picture there is to illustrate how sometimes we will find the, um, that the, comfort, the kind of house you live in may determine what modes of viewing you engage in, whether you are going to engage in a lot more deliberate viewing. If your house is not comfortable and you spend all the time outside, you will only go to watch the program that you are interested in. But if your house is comfortable and you are sitting inside, then you may start to watch a lot more, in which case you become information rich and those who need more information are information poor. We're almost there, okay? So I don't need to give you an example of communal viewing. A lot of you did communal viewing last night. I heard the sounds. 
I wasn't watching TV, but I knew each time there was a goal, I knew what was going on. I could hear the sound. So thank God for communal viewing as a case. Is. So I'm going on, I'm almost done now. Social media. Um, I think essentially what I'm saying with this is how social media illustrates to us the fact that audiences are now active. The agency of audiences is what I'm talking about here. Now, um, th this slide is essentially also to speak to those who are in governance, to say that how do we harness the media? Once upon a time, we were used to the top-down approach. Just set up an NTA and put your DGs there. Squeeze the DG and the people under him will do what you want. In nah, it doesn't happen anymore. If you squeeze the DG and he, and he does what you want, the people are going out to talk to themselves. And so you, if you look at the, the image below, um, the, 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 the rhizome, the rhizome structure, the rhizomatic structure is saying information wants to be free and people are not going to allow themselves to be squeezed. The indigenous systems is something that we have, um, that we've mentioned as well. And one thing, one of the, uh, this is something that I also learned from um, Mascom, Professor Gwaja uh, had advocated about aura media, which we've talked about. Uh, so I, you, again, I won't go into details. But one thing I wanted to add to that is that the marketplace is, uh, they are, the marketplaces are, foro, uh, are, are the, the forum where women converge. And if that's the, pl if that's the place, if it becomes, if we want to understand the women, if we want to reach the women and not further marginalize them, if we don't want to further marginalize half the population, then we need to take that kind of space seriously as well. Okay, getting there. So now this is, for me, uh, the interesting thing, the theory behind this, and this is the, this is the sociologist in me coming out. Um, and I, I've looked at the organic model of uh, organic model that was advocated by Emil Durkheim. Emil Durkheim has been given the credit for that. Uh, but what I've added to that, and he compares the the, 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 the society to a body to, that each, each, each element in, the, in society has a function to perform, and they're all interrelated. And I've taken that a step further and said the media are like the skeleton in the body in that we help the, me the body to move, we help to move society. The bones helping to store vital minerals, uh, in this case vital, um, um, vital inf uh, information. We store vital information and release as need be. Indeed, we are the protective cage for the vital organs. So we are serving every part of society. Is it health, education, commerce, Everyone needs the media. We are central like that. And so I call us the central nervous system. So maybe I should leave these questions and just go on to my conclusion. Or oh, um, let's see. I'm really almost there. But I, I ask us to think about how well we can cope with our fiscal location. To what should we aspire? What goals must be attained if society must be in harmony with itself? If members and those around it, uh, uh, if its members and those around it would be at peace with themselves, can we deal with incursions, the arrival of new people or new ideas or emergencies, of new, the emergence of new situations and um, continued coexistence? Don't come. Up. How do we persuade, motivate, mobilize, instruct, even cooperate with others to maintain the society? Okay, so this is me saying that the media are all encompassing. You can read about the Agile model, adaptation, goal attainment, latency, sorry, integration and latency in the book. And this is the media, I would say, would be all encompassing. Whereas Adaptation has been reserved for the economy, um, goal attainment for politics, um, integration for the legal, um, socialization, latency, that is uh, pattern maintenance and tension management for education and um, the religious institutions and family. The media helps all of them. This is my key argument. 
So you'll be pleased to see Professor Wachuku. <laughs> you'll be pleased to see that I've come to my conclusion. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so what have I said? What have I argued today? That mass media are a feature of industrialization and that they are reliant on technology. That media are more than technology, technological devices. I've argued also, it seemed at some point that the technology were all imported. And I raised, the, uh, I raised to the fore the fact that our own artifacts are actually very important and very relevant and can, must be understood and integrated with the technologies of broadcasting, of uh, even of print and of film, okay? So but audiences have agency. We can't just spoon feed them. I think we need to reconsider the way in which we understand audience engagement with the media. Can radio and TV still be regarded as unwelcome visitors into our spaces? As I said, we are no longer in the era where we push things out. Audiences actually pull down what they want these days. That's because they have control. Now, this is crucial. We need new policies. I'm glad that my teacher is still here, Professor Akifale, um, who has been very involved in uh, a lot of the national uh, policies for communication in the country. Um, we need new policies to make our national broadcasters, that is NTA and FRCN, become relevant and effective national institutions again. Sadly, I think the way they've, be, they've been treated, our understanding of how they work, has made them a little, not, a little less relevant. I'll be kind and I won't say they've gone moribund. Okay. Newly created media spaces are designed to foster participation. Audiences want to participate, and anybody who's not going to allow them to participate. This is the Sorosoke generation. Everybody wants to Sorosoke. So if we won't let people Sorosoke, they will vote with their legs and their hands and their fingers and all of that. So there's a ready army of enthusiasts. That's the other thing. It's not just that they are walking away from national media institutions. They are, there's an army of enthusiasts who are involved in producing. They are not just using the media, they are also producing. They are share, share, share. They are sharing, okay? So it's important for us to see. And there's still room. Sometimes you would imagine, is there still room for those of us who are professionals? I would argue that there's still room for us to we need to reinvent ourselves to show just how things should be done. So, final thoughts. And this is a note of caution. Nollywood's determination to tell African stories and promote the African culture is most encouraging. Having carved out this niche, I'm appealing, not just to Nollywood, but to radio and to television as well, that we should not allow commercial imperatives to we cloud that vision that we started with. We wanted to tell African stories. The question is, are we telling African stories now? I, I, I have a category that I call local, but, local uh, input, but for, local but foreign programs. They are locally produced, but they are foreign orientation. We need to watch out for that. So. This is where I get to the point of acknowledgement, and I must stand up to do this. Thank you very much. My acknowledgement goes to my family. I didn't have Baba. My dad and mom have put their photograph there. My mom and dad, in love, I thank them as well. Professor Olani Pekwenson, Mrs. Selina Esson, I thank them immensely for the support that they've been to me over the years. I thank God for my husband. He's not here, but I wish he had been here today. I thank God for his life. He was there with me. He urged me along. 
Thank you, Femi. I am wrote to me. Follow me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now this is the Esso clan and the Oyobanjos. What's left of us? Some of us have gone. I thank God for everyone. I thank God for my wider family, the Taiwos, represented today by my sister. And her husband. And my brother, thank you. I thank God for my teachers. They've both gone now. Both these gentlemen have gone, my supervisors. I thank God for them. Thank God for Professor Akifele, who's representing all my teachers. A lot of people have gone. To God be praised. Even this week, as I was preparing, I had to steal myself. A classmate of mine, Stella Apiafi, rest in peace. She, I mean, th th these, are, these are the things that we deal with, but then we thank God. I thank God for um, ACSPN. And recognize Professor Lyo Shaw. God rest his soul. Our founding president. Missy, I told you I was going to surprise you. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. You hadn't seen the photographs. I was moving the wrong slides. Those are the two gentlemen who have gone. That's the family. That's Professor Lyosho. God save you. Missy, God save you. I don't think our picture is clear. <laughs> but then, I don't know that you can see the VC in his earlier incarnation. And now, <laughs> I bless God for you, sir. Thank you. Right, there are a few people that I, that my slides didn't capture, so I just have to go quickly to my, and you know I'm not much, I'm not for much protocol, so that won't take time. I must thank my family here at Caleb. I must thank taking forever to get down there, right? Okay, back up. Okay. Yeah. I, as you would have read from the book, there are a list of names of people who have been very, um, who have played a very germane role in my life and the life of my family. I thank them all. I won't hold you up by reading the, the list. MGHS OGA, can you wave your hands? I said even our big greens are instruct, were instructive. You can see it came out in the lecture. My Bado school friends, they're not care. And I single out Motunde Shebanjo. Why I single her out? She's also an OGMG um, and she's also an Ibado friend. Why I single her out is she was the one who wrote the application that was sent to Unilag that set me on this path, apart from the fact that she's a great friend and all. Thank God for her. The list of my teachers you, I have done. Omka. Is Omka here? Hey, 
my people. And I've seen well, if I had a Mosu, where are you? I thank you all. I thank you all. I haven't thanked my I haven't thanked my um, Caleb community. Everyone in Caleb. Yes, I yeah. My Casmas family, great communicators, information unit, ICT. Which other department have I? Bursary, um, library. I just thank God for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, hospitality, the, the depart, every registry. Where's Mrs. R, Mrs. Rabiu? And our department, everyone has been so great looking out for me. I thank God for you all. I thank you. I really, really thank you. Ah, Professor Dada, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you all. So, my last slide. Don't worry. We're done. I lift up my eyes onto the help come from. To God be praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I encourage you. Listen, guys, this is outside. I'm not the sharpest tool in the box. I can't boast to be the one who was first in school. I wasn't even, I was never even in first five. But with great, in fact, I remember final year in university. Let my people go, Joe. But then I'll remember my mom. And I'll say, what if I aim for third class? And I end up something with a pass. Let me aim higher. And so I did. I've done this to honor her. I've done this to honor my parents. I've done it to honor my children. I've done it to honor my family. I've done it to honor the Lord. Whatever I am today, to God be all the glory. Thank you. Standing ovation is appropriate. It is proper. Thank you very much, man. We thank God for your life. Glory to God that this day has come. Thank you very much, man. Yes, um, it, it is left for me. Yes, please hold on. Please be seated, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor now to, because a short ritual is going to be carried out, and only one person is qualified to super <laughs> super you know supervise that and be in charge of it and i humbly as always invite the vice chancellor professor Nosso and Sibe to do the induction ceremony put your hands together yes, praise the lord praise the lord let us hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice, oh God, to the Father, through Jesus, my Son, and give Him that glory, great is He has. One more time. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let me hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Unto the Lamb of 
upon the throne We especially that she has delivered. I know what happened during the lecture is the story of our journey. Every one of us, she's back on her feet. Glory be to God. No matter how long you spend in the university, a day comes especially when you are a professor, that you must give an account of your professorship. And I want to thank God that she has given an account of her professorship. What was her percentage? 110%. Praise the Lord. Now, this is a critical activity. And we will, I will now induct Professor Oluinka Anuola Esson. Yes. Yes, Anuolu Esson. So, on behalf of the Senate of Caleb University, the best university in any part of this world. Let me tell you, you know, she said something and she was actually talking about localization. We have local, we have global, but now we have products of localization. It's my pleasure and privilege to induct again Professor Olu Inka Anuolu Esson as a professor of broadcasting. forgiving you, you know. I want to invite the family to join Professor Esson. The nuclear family first. Uh, are you mide?
Please come and join.